coming along to Living Well Expo. We have a really exciting program today and our first wonderful speaker is Deb Nye Tart from, from WA, which is a nice thing to know that we've got quite a few WA represented exhibitors and presenters here. Deb is a naturopath and she has a special interest in gut health, particularly through chronic inflammation of the body and the thyroid and various other flow-on effects of chronic inflammation. I'm going to hand over to Deb and I'd like you all to give her a very warm round of applause. Thank you very much and thank you all for joining me today. Thanks to the um, Living Well in WA Expo team for putting on such a great event and um, making all of this possible. Um, this morning I'm hoping to send you away with a few useful, simple tools to improve your health and therefore your quality of life. Um, I got involved in natural therapies because of my own personal health issues. I was diagnosed with Graves disease, which is an autoimmune thyroid disorder, um, just after the birth of my second child. Um, when I started getting interested in natural therapies, I realised that my fairly dysfunctional family history, marriage breakdowns and all that sort of thing from my parents, and uh, a whole host of autoimmune diseases in the family may, uh, made me realise that I was probably going to have to work pretty hard to stay well or get, get well again and then stay well. And that's the reality for um, quite a few of us. Um, we have to work with the pack of cards we're dealt and for some of us that means we just have to work a little bit harder to have good health. Um, just a little bit more about me. Um, I'm a bit of a crazy lady. I don't sit still very often. I'm involved in four separate businesses in Mount Barker. Um, my business is Healing Naturally WA, which is a wellness centre. I work as a naturopath. I do consult with clients a couple of days a week and we have a remedial massage therapist there as well. Early on in my studies, I got involved in making herbal teas. It started out just for fun, and then it gradually grew into business that's kind of a little out of control. Um, in the last couple of years, we started playing with herbal powders, uh, and now I've got a lovely um, range of herbal powders that um, uh, I've got a team of people helping me develop for the market. Um, so um, that's what I'm playing with on the side. And then we've got Natu, Natu Vet Animal Health Solutions, which is, um, m my husband is a veterinarian. He runs Mount Barker Veterinary Hospital. I'm involved in the veterinary hospital too. We do um, natural consultations for clients who are interested in natural therapies for their pets. And we're gradually developing a range of animal health natural products, which are mostly powdered based these days. We started off with the, the herbal tea um, sort of herbs um, that were leaf and um, root and that sort of thing, but we find the powders are so much easier for people to deal with. Um, and then uh, at home, we have Nylands Farm. We have a small farm and a horse adjustment centre. If I'm not working, I'm usually with a horse or on a horse. Uh, we camp draft these days. We played polo cross for about 20 years. Um, both my kids played polo cross. My son played at state level for a number of years. He's still playing. So horses are very much a part of our lives. And the interesting thing with that is the synergy with all of what I do is nutrition, nutrition and plant medicine. And um, my husband is a vet, he specialises in food production animals. So nutrition is really huge for us and we spend a lot of time talking about it a and dealing with um, nutritional deficiencies on different levels. And funnily enough, a lot of the clients I see are his clients because it's a small community. Um, so I talk to them about their animals as well as their health and he does the same. Um, successful farmers, we find, test and treat the soil that they're working with and they look for nutritional deficiencies and, and resolve them. They test their animals for nutritional deficiencies and, and they resolve them. And the, I get on farm now and again when I'm working with my husband. Um, when he's short-staffed, I go and help with the bull testing and that's just completely different and a bit of fun. Um, talking to the farmers about the nutritional deficiencies they're finding in the herds is really interesting because there's an amazing correlation between what they're seeing and what I'm seeing in practice. Every single client that comes to me, I send them off for an iron test and a vitamin T test on the first consult. Like, let's just, they're the most common ones I see, let's get that checked. About 90% of the patients come back really, really low in iron, really low in vitamin D. It's really interesting. The farmers, they're seeing the same thing. 
Cows who live all day in the paddock and eat grass, low in vitamin D. Get that. It's re that really spun me out for a while, but I, after a lot of research and talking to a lot of people, the agreement is very much, it comes back to the gut. It's all about the balance of the microflora. So farmers now are looking at the microflora for their for cows too. And they're using probiotics too. And they're looking at prebiotics and they're looking at their feed mixes. And that's what we need to be doing for ourselves as well. So, yeah, messing around with animals, it just reinforces what I do with humans. And, and reverse, too. So what brings all of you here today? It's a Sunday morning, it's glorious outside. 10 o'clock in the morning, why would you be here? It tells me that you've probably either got a, your own health concerns or a dear family member with a health concern. So where are you on this health continuum? It's really, really important for you to identify. None of us are motivated to change, because change is uncomfortable unless we've got a degree of discomfort or something forcing us, a little slap, to um, make you change. So um, if you're on that right side um, towards wellness, you're probably not too interested in changing everything, anything. You're probably doing most things right. Um, if you're in that comfort zone, you know, you probably know you should do a few things, but you're probably not very motivated. It's when you start moving towards the left and you start feeling uncomfortable and you're off to the doctors and he can't find anything wrong. That's still a fairly good phase, believe it or not. Once he diagnoses with you uh, with a condition, you're heading a long way to the left and it's gonna get harder and harder to reverse that damage. And so I really, really recommend to you, even if you're to the right of that comfort zone, Focus on the tools that I'm going to give you today and make a few changes. And even if you only make one or two changes at a time, it will help you stay to the right of that continuum, which is where you want to be. When you get all a long way to the left, or if you're in this... Um, it's opposite on my computer. Sorry, guys. I didn't look up. So here, if you're on the right in the illness zone, um, it's really, really hard to reverse the damage. And the further you go that way, um, it's going to take longer for the tools that I'm going to give you to work. And you're going to need to use more of those tools. If you're in this neutral zone or just a little bit to the right of that, then you're going to find um, you might only need to implement one or two tools. You might only need to do it 80% of the time. You can still get away with you know, a few naughty foods and a few late nights and be okay and still improve your health. So be aware of that. Know where you are in the continuum. Be aware of how much you really need to work at it to reverse the damage. So um, the tools I'm going to give you today, I'm going to talk about them right up front because I really want you to take this home with you. Use the right fuel for your body. Stop thinking about food as purely pleasure. Think about food as fuel for your body. What's the right fuel for your body? Do you love yourself enough to put the right fuel in your body? Um, move more. You know, all right, it doesn't have to be exercise. Don't think about an exercise, just move more. And that will depend on your degree of health, how far you are on that continuum, how much exercise is going to be right for you. And it might be just, you know, taking the dog for a walk, getting down to the beach, just going for a little stroll along the sand. Um, those sorts of things can be just enough, especially if you're really unwell. Um, find your calm. All right, I'm going to talk about stress a lot, but really let's focus on the reverse get into a calm state a couple of times a day at least. And there's lots of different skills I'm going to talk about that will help you with that. Active rest. We talk about resting a lot if you're not well, but really the most effective rest is usually active rest. And it involves getting out in nature. Um, you know, Going for a walk, going for a hike in the hills, going for a walk along the beach, take a swim. Those kind of things re-energize you far more than a nap on the couch. Um, and then the last one, plants, not pills. And that, that's what I'm really big about, and that's a lot of what I do, is finding whole food solutions for people rather than pills. Okay, so the talk today is very much about inflama inflammation. Anyone with any kind of chronic disease is going to have a whole lot of inflammation. So inflammation is a really natural process in the body. Um, we talk about acute inflammation versus chronic inflammation. And acute inflammation is that inflammation that sets in when you sprain an ankle. And it's really obvious um, inflammation in that kind of um, situation 
uh, represents as heat, swelling, you know, the ankle gets puffy, it gets hot, you need to ice it to, to bring down that heat. Um, you get loss of function, you can't walk on that leg. Um, but it all resolves, usually if everything's going well, pretty quickly, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you're good as gold again. Really important to, rem to remember, beginning on that degree of acute damage, even though you're back functioning again and everything seems fine, what we find when we do testing is there might be a residual amount of inflammation left. And the interesting thing with that is this is where we start to develop our points of weakness and start to kind of develop an inflammation load, if you like. So even acute um, infl inflammation repetitively happening can start to develop what we call a chronic inflammation load. So chronic inflammation is really harmful. It's inflammation gone wrong. It's uh, the immune system is really not functioning that great. And we start to see um, a range of signs and symptoms that you know, gradually develop into disease states. Some people, um, through genetic, um, you know, that pack of cards, through genetics, through the inheritances from the family history, um, are more inclined to um, develop inflammation. And it, it actually has to do with um, the messengers in the body. There's something called interleukin-6, which is, um, increases inflammation, and we have interleukin-10, which dampens inflammation in the body. So they're, they're natural um, messengers that are um, carrying messengers in the immune system all the time. Some of us naturally have more IL-6 and less IL-10. So we're already behind the ball with, with the inflammation thing and we have to work a bit harder. Inflammare uh, comes from the word fire, inflammare for fire. And again, it comes back to that con health continuum. Where are you in that? How much inflammation have you got in your body? Most of us, want, especially once we get to adulthood, with all the things that are going on in our world, with the toxins that we're exposed to, with the stresses we're exposed to, a few little accidents along the way, have at least a small amount of inflammation, even though we're reasonably healthy and we're unaware of that. Because the chronic inflammation tends to be a bit quieter. It's not as obvious as that acute, acute inflammation inflammatory stage. So some of the signs of chronic inflammation though, that the um, one that we see the most is depression. Um, those mental health conditions really, inflammation of the brain. Um, abdominal pain, it's ongoing. You know, we're talking about inflammation in the gut then. Um, people who are always tired, lethargic, feeling really fatigued, that's an inflammation state. Um, people with sleep issues, um, we find you know, sleep issues are really, really hard to deal and you can't deal with them head on. You have to be sneaky and you have to work out what the underlying cause is with sleep issues. And it's all invariably multi-layered. People with sleep issues are usually wired but tired. They're really, really tired, but they can't shut that stuff off in the head. They can't relax. Um, if we treat the inflammation, often we get a good, really good result. Um, and then we've got joint muscle pain, that's a more obvious one, and that's very much your arthritis kind of conditions, and, and, and that's inflammation, and a lot of those people are already taking anti-inflammatory drugs when they see me, and unfortunately, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, it's not very helpful. Allergies and asthma, another kind of inflammation going on at a deeper level. Skin problems and rashes, you know, it's bright red, yeah, it should be a fairly good tag for inflammation in the body. Um, and then, that, you know, coming back to that health continuum, where are you on the health continuum? We've got past that point of these are just vague symptoms. You've been to the doctor and he's given you a diagnosis. Yes, you've got arthritis or you've got sinusitis. That itis on the end just means inflammation. Um, and unfortunately, by the time the doctor says, yes, you've got this disease, it's been going a while and it's, you know, you're quite advanced. You're getting to that bushfire stage. Um, we also see a lot of hormone dysregulation in women when there's a lot of inflammation in the body. Um, the hormones are very, very impacted by gut health and immune dysfunction. Um, so is the thyroid. Chronic, chronic um, inflammatory diseases that we see, um, there's so many of them. And you know, diabetes is one, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, really, really interesting. My mother-in-law is 83. Amazingly healthy woman, one of the few people I know at that age who still don't take any medications whatsoever. 
but she is starting to lose her memory and she is getting very forgetful and it kind of cuts in and out. I have a lovely product that I give her. She, she won't take pills or potions or anything, but um, it's just a an natural anti-inflammatory and when she takes that, her memory is much, much better. It's really interesting and instantly. And she's aware of that now. As long as we don't, as long as she doesn't forget to take her pills, we're good. Um, so, all of these things, if we treat the inflammation, we get an improvement in symptoms, and often very quickly. So, our immune system. One of the things that happens with the immune system, it's been working too hard, and it gets a bit tired, and you're a bit deficient, and it gets weak. And in that situation, we see people getting lots of cold and flus. They're more inclined to catch the virus that's going around. Um, the other side of the coin that is also um, immune dysregulation is the overactive immune system, the immune system that starts reacting to all sorts of things. And that gradually develops into what we call autoimmune disease. And autoimmune diseases are really, really horrible. And autoimmune diseases tend to like to run in packs. So once you've got one autoimmune disease, the chances of you then developing a couple more are really, really high if we can't we start to reverse some of that damage and if we can't start to support that immune system and get it on track again. Um, so that, you know, we see a lot of, I see a lot of thyroid issues. It's really, really common. Um, Hashimoto's is probably the most common thyroid disease where the thyroid's just not working really well. It's really under-functioning and it has a huge impact on the whole of the body, the whole, all of the metabolic processes. Um, Rheumatoid arthritis, um, the, one of the, the autoimmune diseases that I'm seeing so much now, I work in gut health a lot, and seeing younger and younger people coming in with diagnosis of Crohn's disease already. And the medical approach is scary because these, these young people have um, you know, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are both what we call inflammatory bowel diseases. Their, their gut is so damaged that the only option for the doctors is to take pieces of their bowel up. And so you've got 20 year olds that are already getting pieces of their bowel chopped out. And every year they're back to have a bit more chopped out because a bit more is infected to the point where it can't function anymore. Um, so you can imagine where are they gonna be in a few years time? You can't keep chopping out bits of the bowel. It might be pretty jolly long, but that has serious consequences for people. And they, again, have high levels of inflammation throughout the body. Disease tends to attack the sites of weakness. Each of us are different. Each of us have a very different genetic makeup. So disease will hit us in different ways. And as I say, even though inflammation undercarries all of these diseases, and that's why I tend to focus on the inflammation, I'm not too worried about the name of the condition that you have because the treatment that I'll use will be much the same most of the time. And that's where it's why I say there's some really simple tools to use that work in all of these conditions. The inflammatory triggers, triggers have put gut health in the center. Gut health is impacted by all those other triggers. And if your gut's disturbed, you're not gonna have good quality of life and it's gradually going to get worse if we don't fix the gut. Um, so that's very central. Um, and the gut is, you know, being impacted by nutritional deficiencies. But if it, you know, the, the reverse is if you've got nutritional deficiencies, you can't, your gut's not going to work properly. Um, it's simple things like zinc. If you're low in zinc, you're going to be low in stomach acid. So when, and you're going to be low in digestive enzymes. So digestion starts in the mouth. Um, there are digestive enzymes, particularly amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates in the saliva. If you're low in zinc, you're low in um, those digestive enzymes, so the digestive process that's supposed to start in the mouth is not working great. It's low in stomach acid, the food that's getting to your stomach is not being broken down properly as it moves off into the small intestine. And that's where we start to run into trouble and that's where um, autoimmune diseases can start or even it, we start off with food sensitivities usually. Um, so there's this real vicious cycle of nutritional deficiencies both causing and being caused by poor gut health. Initially we'd see just that disturbed microbiome, that imbalance of the good guys and the bad guys in the gut. And the interesting thing is we talk about the good guys and the bad guys a lot and we talk about what we call potentially pathogenic bacteria. But um, most of the bacteria, more than 90% of the 100 trillion organisms that live in your body are really good for you and beneficial and they're helpful while they're in correct balance. 
but it's just as bad for you to have too few E. coli, which is considered a bad bug, as too many um, Lactobacillus acidophilus, who you know, is considered a good guy, but if he gets out of control and takes over, there's no room for anybody else. It, that creates disturbances in the body too. Um, so we need to maintain a balance there. When that dysbiosis starts to, be, um, to get worse, we then start to see leaky gut. And leaky gut, the, the medical profession call um, increased um, intestinal permeability. And I don't know if you um, understand the process, but the small intestine, um, the wall is not a solid wall. It actually has gaps. So cells sit side by side, and they're controlled by something called a tight junction. That tight junction is weakened by a number of factors, um, herbicides in particular, um, gluten. Um, there's the, the, the people that study um, gluten intolerance and celiac disease, a wonderful man who's the world leader in it, uh, discovered a few years ago that if we look at those tight junctions in perfectly normal people without celiac disease who are perfectly healthy, that their tight junctions will be weakened for up to eight hours after they've ingested gluten. Um, so gluten weakens that tight junction and, and makes it more likely for food particles to slip into the bloodstream. Herbicides are probably about 100 times more likely to w weaken those tight junctions as well in all of us. So again, it sets up that situation where food particles that should have been broken down better but your enzymes aren't working, your stomach acid's too low, those um, food particles get into the bloodstream. The immune system reacts to that and says there's an invader and sets off a whole immune reaction and your body starts to become sensitive to foods and say, hey, that's a bad guy, watch out. Um, and what we find if that's not dealt with very early on, you become sensitive to more and more foods. Early on in my career, a dear friend was having lots of health issues. We talked her into having a, a test for what we call IgG, food sensitivities. Uh, the test tested 96 different foods. She tested positive to 84 of them. She came out of there going, what am I going to eat? Um, and, and that's a fairly common situation that we see with people who have already got a severe um, health condition. But how healthy is your gut? Do a little review for yourselves. If you've got any of these um, symptoms, you really need to be working on your gut health. I see lots of people um, who are complaining of bloating after eating. Uh, we should add in there also tired after eating. If you feel a bit tired and flat after you've had a meal, it means you're not digesting as well as you should be. Getting back to those tools, use the right fuel, move more, find your calm, active rest, and plants, not pills. Some of the foods that we like to eat actually increase the inflammation in the body. And if we can just avoid these inflammatory foods, we're already starting to reduce the inflammation in our body. And food is really, really powerful. And I find it really, really hard to convince people of this. But once you've experienced it, it's really, really amazing. If you just take out a few of these really bad guys, if your diet is still full of processed foods, full of sugars, you like to eat at McDonald's, you like your takeaway, um, or you have soft drinks, you're going to find just taking those simple foods out of your diet will make a huge difference to your health. Now, the caveat on that is if you've got that bushfire going on, Making one or two changes, you may not notice much change because you're in that group of people that needs to make a lot of changes to make a noticeable difference to that bushfire worth of inflammation that's going on. So I have a lot of people who come to me and go, oh, I took gluten out of the diet and I didn't notice any difference. I don't think it's gluten. Well, if you've got a lot of inflammation, it's kind of like just taking... Um, one, one empty can out of the rubbish tin and taking out its bin, but not bothering to take the whole um, rubbish bag out. You know, it's not going to make much difference. So that's why you don't notice a difference. So if there's a lot of inflammation, we've got to be prepared to make a lot of changes. And I don't recommend you take, make all those changes all at once. Just making one simple change at a time over a few weeks is a lot easier for most people to manage. Um, and allows the body a little bit of opportunity to adjust. When it comes to sugars, if you can give up sugar for just two weeks, your taste buds will change dramatically, and the next time you have sugar, you'll be like, oh my goodness, that's so sweet, how could I have eaten that before? 
but you've got to be really strict for two weeks or you don't get through that addiction phase that sugar has. Um, and the same as with, with carbohydrates. So many people, oh, I can't give up bread. The reality is if you can just give up bread for a couple of weeks, you will realise what a difference that's making to your life and usually that will be enough to convince you to, oh, well, actually maybe I can live without that because now I'm not so bloaty and uncomfortable. Um, so, so while some, of these, some people are challenged by these recommendations to change their diet, I really challenge you to give it a go. We've talked about the sugars and the carbohydrates. The carbohydrate foods, you know, your bread, your pasta, your rice, cakes, crackers, even just cutting down dramatically on that for most people can make a difference. Then we get on to the fats. I re and we'll talk about the well, good things that are later on. I really encourage people to have a high fat diet, but be really, really choosy about the quality of your fats. So margarine is not a good fat. Sunflower oil bought at the supermarket is not a good fat. Fried foods, positively poisonous to the system. Um, and one of the things that happens with fats that will make them diabolically worse for us is our body needs essential fatty acids. There are some fats that the body really, really needs. But if you're eating these bad fats, it's taking, taking up the space in your cells where that good fat needs to go. So the good fat that you might be eating in small amounts usually isn't getting where it needs to be because someone else has taken its spot. So that's why fat, bad fats are even worse for us and get in the way. So fried for foods fall into that category as well. And then the artificial sweeteners, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I know I can't have sugars, my insulin levels aren't great, or I've got diabetes, so I'll just have the Coke Zero, or I'll just add some, one of the artificials, xylitol, or um, that to, to my food. Those are chemicals that are really, really damaging to the system, and they, they wreak havoc. So please don't do the artificial sweeteners. Grains, grains, dairy, be, uh, red meat. A lot of people like, oh, aren't they healthy foods? Ideally they are, but let's look at how they're being treated. Let's think about where your food comes from. And the reality is most of our grains these days are very heavily sprayed with fungicides, herbicides, p pesticides, the whole lot. Um, do you really want that in your body? And they've um, genetically modified grains so much that it doesn't resemble the grains of 100 years ago at all. And this has an impact on how we um, digest them. The other thing is, when, when, especially bread, bread's a really classic one of, of how differently we, we produce bread now to say traditionally 100 years ago. Um, the yeast that we use to make bread and the, breads and the grains themselves. Grains should be soaked overnight. If you soak and ferment a grain, it's easily absorbed by the body. If you use a grain um, straight up without soaking it, your body actually can't absorb a lot of the nutrients. And then the other problem is the milling process. Grains are really high in vitamin Bs, yeah, we all know that, and all these great things. But that's the whole grain. Once you've milled it into flour, you've lost 90% of the nutrients of that grain. So please don't think grains are great unless you're eating a whole grain. And, and if you're going to eat a whole grain, make sure you soak it first. So that, that's why I say, you know, maybe it's just easier for you to avoid grains while you're trying to get your inflammation down. So going back to our inflammatory triggers, the next one we want to talk about is stress. So I'm stressed. Stress has a huge impact on our health. Stress has a huge impact on our gut. Think about the last time you were stressed and you really noticed that your muscles were a little bit tight. That's exactly what you're doing to your gut muscles when you're stressed. We talk about being uptight. I'm a remedial massage therapist as well and it was a really amazing light bulb moment when I realized how much uptight is really this, you know, and we come in with people and they've got sore shoulders and their necks really sore because they're walking around like this all day and they don't really even realise it. So just breathe, just relax, get the shoulders down. Um, people have busy stress. Um, there's a phrase that's been coined, rushing women syndrome, and it is so true. So many women are just on the go all the time. They're, they've got full-time jobs, they've got teenagers at school, the kids are you know, into sport, they're into art, they've got their music class, mum's the taxi service, um, trying to cook for the family. You know, mums are really, really stressed and taking on a huge load these days. A lot of people have got a lot of financial stress. You know, our farmers at the moment, it, the weather's beautiful out there, but my goodness, I'd love to see some rain. And um, 
people are more and more people I'm seeing are wired but tired. They can't relax. They can't switch down. They can't turn the chatter off in their minds. And it has a huge impact. So that being constantly on the go keeps us in what we call flight and fight mode, um, which is an ancient reaction um, to an acute stress, to the lion we've just seen coming for us. Um, so the body needs to be able to switch out of that. If you just take a deep breath, you will start to switch out of that flight and fight response because shallow breathing is a classic sign of the flight and fight response in progress. And people who are chronically stressed don't realise it, but they're chronically shallow breathing. They've forgotten how to deep breathe. And while you're in that flight and fright mode, your body cut, shuts down a lot of things that it considers not essential for survival. Flight and fright is very much about let's run fast now in a very uh, um, primal way. So to switch that off um, is really, really important because while you're in that mode, you're pumping out cortisol to help you run faster and you're, you've, with the body has switched down on the gut function because we don't need to digest because we need to run right now. So your digestion is heavily impacted by those stresses. Um, negative thought patterns is another stressor that people don't realise. That they're just being too hard on themselves. I'm not good enough. I'm, you know, I'm never going to make it. We can't get out of this hole. Um, Though, if you can change your up, upbeat your thought patterns, upbeat your energy, try and replace a negative thought pattern with a positive one, really, really important for your mental health. Now, people um, worry. You know, it comes back to the negative thought patterns. It's all, it's, it's all me. I'm just, you know, I'm just a really anxious person. I'm just a real stress head. What I see when I start to talk to people and we start to look at nutritional deficiencies is I like to use the term neurotransmitter dysfunction instead of stress, instead of anxiety, instead of depression, because most of those things are driven by nutritional deficiencies. You need lots of B vitamins, lots of zinc, lots of selenium, um, and we need to treat the inflammation for your serotonin levels to be at the level they need to be. Uh, about 80% of your serotonin is actually made in the gut. We need to get the gut working. Um, GABA, which is their anti-anxiety neurotransmitter, needs high levels of glutamine. Uh, the gut needs high levels of glutamine to heal as well. So there's special nutri nutrients we can use to help get your mental health back where it needs to be so that you can find your calm. Genetics. So genetics play a part in that. There's a lot of things going on that we, when we do genetic testing now, we see some really interesting things and a lot of explanations for why some people are more stressed than others. The MTHFR is a really, really interesting one. Some people don't, just don't absorb folate properly. And when we give them an activated form of the folate, uh, a different form, that they respond really well. We see um, something called more factor, where people aren't absorbing zinc or B6. You know, and I've talked briefly about that we need zinc for good gut health. So genetics plays an important impact and impact infections, viruses, um, especially all the envelope viruses have a big impact on our body. Toxins, chemicals, heavy metals, pollution have an impact on our body. We can do some testing. I do a lot of testing with people to work out what these tri underlying triggers are. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that the medical profession give you for fighting inflammation, I just want to let you know they have a lot of side effects. Really think twice about taking them unless you really, really need to. There's some of the side effects. I actually see clients coming and complaining of these things and if we can get them off the non-steroidals, those symptoms just go away. And there's some really serious side effects. Okay, so how do we fight inflammation? Going back to our tools, anti-inflammatory foods, vegetables, guys, have more plants on your plate. You really, really need lots of the greens. Bone broths are really, really great. Good clean water is really, really important. Keeping away from those sugars and processed foods. For people with a lot of inflammation, I recommend the ketogenic diet to reduce inflammation. So that's going very low carb, high in healthy, good quality, high omega-3 fats, because omega-3s are really anti-inflammatory. 
moderate amounts of protein, but focus, please, on the plant-based foods. A lot of people think paleo and ketogenic is all about more bacon, more meat. That's not the way to fight inflammation, even though um, a lot of your fitness people will be doing that. Intermittent fasting, there's lots and lots of studies to show that intermittent fasting is really successful for removing inflammation. There's a lot of nutrients that really help with inflammation. Vitamin D and zinc are two of the ones that I use a lot. Probiotics also. Antioxidants, really, really powerful for reducing inflammation. Now our herbs, and this is what I really wanted to talk to you about, and I've got about three minutes to do it. Turmeric is one of my favorite anti-inflammatory herbs. It's, it's an amazing thing. There's more than 12,000 clinical trials now on the benefits of turmeric and, and proving that that really does work. It's anti-inflammatory. It reduces inflammation on multiple pathways in the body. It's antioxidant. It, the benefits can be felt within an hour or so. It can help buffer. If you really need those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs from the doctor, if you take turmeric as well, it buffers the side effects of those non-steroidals. Turmeric also supports gut health. It supports the gut bacteria and the whole plant is far better than a curcumin extract because there are more benefits to turmeric than just curcumin alone. Boswellia is another herb that um, I use a, a great deal. It's anti-inflammatory. It boosts the immune system. It's particularly good for autoimmune diseases. Um, it works well on brain um, inflammation as well. Rose hips to fight inflammation. I put rose hips in a lot of my in products simply because it's really high in vitamin C and bioflavonoids, and it's a really great natural antihistamine. Some of the products that we have downstairs, please come and see me at store number 55, My Gut Wellness. We have some really new, lovely products. We have Golden Zing, which is a turmeric-based product. It has turmeric, rose hips, ginger, and black pepper. It's a really powerful um, anti-inflammatory. It's something that you can take in your food every day, a couple of times a day. Makes a really nice drink. Um, you can have it hot and cold. You can add it to your smoothie. Frankie and Rose is a new one that we've only recently developed. It's based on frankincense. Um, it also has ashwagandha, which is a gentle Indian ginseng, which is wonderful for adrenal function and energy. And it also has St. Mary's thistle in there, rose hips again. St. Mary's thistle is really good for helping the liver and supporting the liver to detoxify. And choc turmeric latte is my fun one, just to make the golden zing taste better for some of my clients who just needed something a little bit sweeter. Um, we put the raw cacao in. Now, raw cacao is a wonderful antioxidant. We've added mesquite and lacuma to make it a little bit sweeter. So it's a good high fiber product. It's, it's a healthy drink and it's gonna help with inflammation, but it's a bit of a fun one. So I'll just stop there. If, um, we're probably not going to be able to answer too many questions. We, got a, we can. Um, anyone got any questions? Yes. Okay, the vitamin D and iron deficiency comes from um, heavy metals often. Mercury is one that blocks um, iron, it blocks zinc as well. So if you've got um, silver fillings, you've probably got a little bit of mercury um, toxicity going on. That will block your ability to absorb iron and to absorb zinc. Vitamin D, interesting enough, it, it's very directly related to gut health and gut bacteria. So there's a specific um, gut bacteria that helps you convert vitamin D. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Um, I'm going through the raw cacao exercise as a test of effort to get our coffee. Yeah. Um, so far, I can't find anything that's reasonably palatable, or do I have to go through a long adjustment process? Well, as I said, it's not a long adjustment process. Do you have much sugar in your diet, much sweet things? No, I don't. Not these days. But again, if I have a drink like that, I've got to have something. With How do you have your coffee? Okay, so tell me, how do you have your coffee? Um, with coconut cream. Yeah. Occasionally, really good coffee, mate, and I don't do that unless I'm desperate. Uh, but definitely, what type of coffee? It's all place, so I've got to have something with it. 
Okay. So, uh, the Rock Care products, do you have that with coconut cream? Yes. Uh, okay, and you just don't like the flavour? Yeah, so far, it may be a matter of I think so. They, they do vary a lot. It's a bit like our turmeric is really different to a lot of other turmerics on the market. It tastes really different. It smells really sweet. It's actually sweeter. Um, we import it directly from India. We double batch test it for purities because a lot of the cheaper turmerics are um, actually contaminated with heavy metals like lead. Um, and there's a huge variation in curcumin content in turmeric. Um, our turmeric is um, being tested at about 8% curcumin. We put 6% on the label because we don't know if we can maintain getting 8% level cur curcumin all the time. Um, it tastes different to a lot of the other turmerics on the market. They tend to make them more sweet. I would keep trying and I'd probably allow a little bit of time for your taste buds to vary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this lovely, yeah. And this lovely lady here was telling me a, a, a quick story when she first came in about trying the chopped turmeric latte. Um, Holly had sent her a sample. Yeah. So, would you like to speak? Ah, oh, yes, certainly. So, um, last week I um, did some damage. I was riding my bike and I did my toe, and it, it, it was got swollen. And I've got lots of health ideas and things. But I also, um, um, my groin also was hurting in the middle of the night last night. And I'm going, I don't want to take any drugs. I don't take drugs. What can I do? And I remembered Holly had sent me these little um, samples, weren't they? Samples, yeah. And so I just got up in the middle of the night, two o'clock, boiled up some water, put the chopped turmeric uh, latte, whipped it up, <laughs> put some coconut cream in. Took that down. Honest, I've been suffering all day yesterday with this inflammation. Bang, within half an hour, I was fast asleep, woke up this morning, I went, oh, this stuff really works. <laughs> so it's a great story. Yeah, that was a great story, thank you. And that's, the, yeah, oh, hello, yes. Hi, yeah, sorry, I just want to ask about the protein you mentioned. Yes. The curcumin? Yeah. Oh, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying that there's a lot of media attention on curcumin and a lot of um, nutritional companies are extracting the curcumin and giving you a tablet formulation that's just curcumin. And turmeric as a whole plant has another, another ingredient that's well studied now called turmeric. And turmeric works directly on the gut and improves your gut flora. Um, and then there's lots of other ingredients in turmeric that we don't really know what they do yet. So that's why I say take the whole plant rather than take a supplement or an extract. Yeah. Buckwheat? Uh, buckwheat's a tricky one and I have this discussion with a lot of my clients and this is where it's like, where are you on the health continuum? Buckwheat is a really lovely, what we call a pseudo grain, it's not really a grain. Um, if you soak your buckwheat before you use it, great. Um, when I want to use it, I soak it and then I pop it in the dehydrator. Ideally, I let it sprout a little bit before I dehydrate it. I know there's a lady frowning at the back, it sounds like a lot of work. Tastes amazing. Tastes amazing when you do that. It's easier for your body to, to absorb. Nuts, seeds, grains have a coating on them. It's called a phytate. It actually disturbs our digestion. Um, by soaking them, we remove the phytate. Easier for our digestive system to utilise the benefits of that food. If you look at all the traditional cultures across the world, that's what they used to do with their grains. Um, we, we've, just got, we've just got lazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I come from a point now with people that I see with a lot of inflammation, there's no good grain. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. If you've got a lot of inflammation going on, no infl if you've got no inflammation, then quinoa is a good grain. Okay. Your quinoa is great. It's a whole grain. You're using the whole grain. Something organic. Yes, organic. And I soak it from Peru. Fantastic. So if you're soaking it and you're using the whole grain, then, then that's great. As long as you've not got much going on for you health wise. Yeah, yeah, two to three hours, fine. Absolutely. Nuts and seeds, treat them the same way. Yeah? 
I love chia. Chia and linseed, fantastic. They're really high in omega-3s, really, really good for you. They have this funny thing going on where when you add them to a liquid, they go all gooey and jelly. That gooey jelly substance is wonderful for your gut. It's really, really healing. Chia and linseed, very similar. Um, they actually um, are really good for women as well. Um, high in fibre, high in lots of nutrients. They're great. Soak it. Do you have to grind it? Linseed you need to grow, grind, chia you don't. Um, chia you can soak. Well if you've grind it you don't need to soak it, but soaking linseed alone in the whole form is not enough to break down the, the outer shell is the problem. Could we give Deb a wonderful huge round of applause? We could stay here all day, I, I know I could. Uh, there's so much information in this on this subject and Deb is a wealth of information and being a naturopath you're going to get a, a really um, profound holistic um, and also the scientific angles on it so she's a really fabulous person to go down and speak to booth 55 and it's literally just over the landing thank you so much for coming along and I hope you enjoy the expo today <laughs>